<laughs> we are back again with the Terminator. Yes! T2 3D. Cool. Well, Terminator. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Director James Cameron and special effects master Stan Winston have reunited to continue the Terminator saga. But this time, they're back to create more than just a movie. Join them on a journey behind the scenes to Universal Studios Hollywood to witness the challenge of blending a live action stunt show with an amazing 3D film for an experience unlike anything seen before. Terminator is a giant phenomenon. Both of the films, the first two Terminators, have been done extremely well. They have been received all over the world uh, with a gigantic enthusiasm. In the second film, Everybody embraced it, even though we, we took the most sinister killer in history and turned him into a hero. Come with me if you want to live. When Universal Studios Hollywood set out to bring the Terminator films to life and give the audience an experience beyond the movies, they turned to the Terminator's creators, Jim Cameron and Stan Winston. Their idea in this was to, was to integrate a film show with a live show, which I don't think anybody's really done. And then the logical thing was do it in 3D so that the objects on the screen can become almost indistinguishable from the, from the people in the foreground. And you can actually create this kind of breakdown of the barrier between reality and, and film reality. This is what will create tremendous excitement because you will feel that you're actually part of the Terminator story that you are the one that is part of being chased, that you're the one that is in danger while you're sitting there. So we're dependent on a much broader team now. This is not just a filmmaking team. This is a filmmaking team and a live action team all coming together in a mix in a way that it hasn't come together before. Because the experience of Terminator 2 3D would rely not only on film technology, but on live action as well, Universal Studios enlisted the talents of Ride Consultants Landmark Entertainment. All the live guys understand that what we're doing ultimately interconnects with film. And likewise, all the film guys understand that this film doesn't exist on its own. It's going to be part of this live performance. This is the magic ground, you know. This is the film, and this is the stage, and this is what has to happen. It's this area in the center, this part here, that is the unique new thing. And that is what makes this a unique new attraction. <sighs> this is deep. The challenge was set. In order to create the next chapter in the Terminator story, a new type of theater would have to be designed and built at Universal Studios Hollywood. Audiences would find themselves right in the middle of an action-packed stunt show that through state-of-the-art 3D would blend seamlessly with an incredible 70 millimeter film. For the first time in history, live actors would interact with the screen to bring the Terminator to life. Excellent. The genesis of the Terminator attraction was Universal Studios saying, come up with some idea for a Terminator stunt show. Universal has pioneered those things for the entire industry. They have really made it their mission to, to create something new, something you haven't seen or experienced before. And we owe that to Lucas and Spielberg and Cameron and those guys who have created movies that are so compelling and they involve you so much and the effects are so spectacular that the, the whole expectation level of the audience has gone up. We went into it with this sense that we were not just doing a kind of knockoff uh, ride or, or themed attraction to kind of just be spun out from the film, but one that would create a stepping stone to, to a third theatrical production. Hit down. This is break ground. This is a new venue. As Terminator 1 was a, a new venue for film, this is a new venue. As construction began on the Cyberdyne Theater in Hollywood, 
An exact replica of the stage was built in order to choreograph the live stunt show. What we're using that stage to do is to define up front how we're going to have the live actors interface with the 3D. We do actual timings of how long it takes to get downstairs, how long does it take to get across the stage, and we establish the points where film or mechanical effect is going to interact with the actor. Hey, that's going to work. That work. Then you'll come they down, come, come, they come to here and they see the targeting dots coming toward them. They're, they're, they're back and here and they get stopped by the ones coming on this side. Right. You got what? Two T7s yeah, on each side? Three, three on each side. Three on each side. Okay. So we actually have characters jumping into the screen, coming back out of the screen, and we're trying to break down that that barrier between the between the audience and the events in the picture. Are we learning yet? Once the choreography and effects were established on stage, the next challenge was to create a 3D 70 millimeter film that would complete the experience of Terminator 2 3D. Try to put it together. My discussion with MCA went something like, if we're gonna do this, let's really do it. Because they, they had sort of said, well, we'll get a guy, we'll put him in makeup, it'll be kind of a generic Terminator. I said, there's only one Terminator. That's definitely you. If we're gonna do a 70 millimeter film based on the Terminator films, let's get Arnold. Let's get Eddie, let's get Linda, let's get Robert. Speak of the devil, just as I spoke your name, you appeared like a demon. It's Cameron that really motivated me to come here and to do this thing. You have to kind of sell it with attitude because yeah. you want to push him past you and get him ahead of you. When he said, let's shoot this in 3D and all this, I was very enthusiastic. I said, I can work with him again. He, uh, I don't have to worry about anything. I know when I come on the set, the shots are set up in the most perfect way and grand the whole thing and that he will have again the best team together. And when you have someone as committed and creative and imaginative at the helm as Jim Cameron, then it's going to get done. You show up. OK, here we go. Come slamming in. Stand by to roll. Stand by. You skid up to a stop. You look around. Then you see the T-1000 coming. Here we go. Stand by. OK, here we go. Let's roll camera. Roll camera. And action, action. I'll hit him like that. Action! When we come back, we'll see how Universal Studios Hollywood is bringing the Terminator to life beyond the movies. End sticks, end sticks. That is it cut, end sticks. Of course, Cameron again goes a step beyond, and now he shoots 3D. So now we call it uh, T2 3D. In order to create the illusion of live actors jumping into a movie screen, Universal Studios Hollywood set out to create a realistic 3D film that would sweep the audience into the heart of Terminator's future war. This movie is huge. I mean, it was overwhelming when I thought about it. I had no idea what I was getting into as producer, I'll guarantee you. Me and Arnold are gonna jump into the screen, into this 3D world, and you know, it's kind of continuing the T2 story. Reuniting the production team from Terminator 2, the 3D film would require three weeks of night shooting in the Arizona desert. It was wonderful going out and seeing this, this uh, future war set out in the desert. It was very unsettling. It was a, a phenomenal set. It surpassed the sets we had had on the previous shows. I've never even heard of this place before. I said, what, we're going somewhere on the California and the Arizona border, there's a steel mill, there's a mining town. You know, we're out in the middle of the desert, out in the middle of nowhere, you know? And look at this, it's awesome. Actually, give me a big, give me a big yell, because I can carry that yell through the air on the stunt guy. John leaps on the motorcycle, the motorcycle takes off, leaps through the time portal into the into the future, and, and we, the audience, get sucked through into the future behind them, and all of a sudden, we're inhabiting their universe. Jump into the future, you stop and look back. He comes into the future behind you, and his hands grow into, into books. Wow. Wow. T-1000 is still targeted on John and Sarah, and he's chased them back in time to the future world. Here we go. Stand by, Robert. You've gassed and you've taken off. He's taking a swipe at you. And when he gets in there, camera range, about six feet away where I was swatting, I start swatting like crazy. And slam! He's gaining! Let's run it a few times, and we'll tie the camera in the movement of the camera. Okay. The way Jim shoots with action is it's always a moving camera. And that was one of the biggest challenges we had. Come down, little Gino. Higher cliff. Swing the main arm over. OK, up a little higher. OK, Dougie, come to the right. This is a move. You know, these 3D cameras are huge. These are 3D 70 millimeter, two cameras mounted. They weigh tons. One is shooting down into a beam splitter, and the other one is shooting through it in order to get the two images uh, aligned. So new equipment had to be developed. 
uh, to allow Jim to get the kind of shots that, that, that he wants to get. We probably had every crane ever built uh, maneuvering a 600-pound package around, including cable cam, which can move up to 30, 40 miles an hour. We hooked our 600-pound rig to that. He came to me before we started shooting. He says, this rigging is entirely different than on Terminator 2. This enables me to get much better shots here. For me, the trick to doing 3D is to not to have one kind of gag where something's coming straight out at you af after another. So basically what it amounts to is when you go, these things are growing right out to the audience. You have to tell a story, you have to have a narrative, and you have to stick to the normal cinematic style. And then every once in a while, if something should happen to come off the screen and come into the audience, right, that's it. you try to integrate that in an organic way so it doesn't, the audience doesn't feel like they're just getting poked in the eye one time after another. Even though the goal is to poke them in the eye one time after another. Because I want to set the stage for a shot where we go into one of these hits and we see it come back and go go past the land. Jim Cameron is a director that always goes all the way and then much more. Lazy we don't want. Let me show you what I want you to do. It kind of goes like that. Why don't you shoot to my hand? You gotta get your foot seated deep, deep into this fender. And he will drive everyone crazy about set decorating, what the set should look like. He has a very clear vision. And he is just such a perfectionist. That's just the way he is. Okay, here we go, rehearsing. Well, they kept saying, you're gonna be running a lot. How fast do you wanna go? And I think I've run more in this than I did in the movie. Action! The wheels of the T-1000 really <laughs> <laughs> stiff. But so far, I haven't let myself down. I caught him. A mile up the road there. There's a lot of running, escaping, trying to hide, trying to get away from the enemy and all those things. So I have to practice the spinning of the gun in a very efficient way and in a very accurate way. In order to really sell the idea that it's a machine that I am. Rather than a regular human being. Careful, I don't we need that camera. Then I have this gun with me in the car, I have it in the office, I take it with me everywhere just to practice all the time. So it again becomes second nature. That's fabulous. You cock the gun, fire again, his head comes open into the sauce head effect, which does stop him. He tumbles and falls. You're gonna see it blast open, and this guy will be going down on the gun. Ready and action! Fight! That's bitch. We just wanna do one more. I wanna I wanna lessen this fire. And we're, on the, we're on to the next shot. Do one where we start on the robot. There we we have now that opportunity to take something we have developed to a certain extent and now develop it even a little bit further. We, of course, are bringing the endoskeleton back to life. We have walking rigs that are carried on Shane Mahan's shoulder. Yeah. We have the endoskeleton attached yeah. to a crane arm. Yeah. We use all of these different methods to take this, uh, this machine that's supposed to be able to walk on his own and uh, assimilate his walk. Now the body is going to surge up, up and forward and down. And, down, right. and you're going to wind up in this position. The thing that was really important for me was because it was such a technological project with these huge cameras, very sophisticated, very sophisticated visual effects and computer animation and all that, I always have to keep my eye clearly on the ball with respect to story and character. Um, you're missing the point. As long as she's got ammo, she has to be fighting the T-1000. If she's fighting the T-1000 and we don't see the outcome, we go into right. the future, and the next thing we know, the T-1000 comes jumping into the future with us. Sarah's dead. The audience finds their way into a story like this through the characters. And even beyond that, we've created new machines, new adversaries, uh, new problems for the Terminator to face, and those are in 3D. So you're going to see a step in the evolution of the story and of the characters in T-2 Battle Across Time, which may be finished in the, in the third film. In order to continue the dynamic action in the war between humans and machines, Cameron assembled an army of effects technicians and stuntmen. With a mind-boggling array of pyrotechnics, they would surround John and the Terminator with laser blasts from a flying hunter killer, which would be added to the scene later in post-production. And we can have him play around and come back in a big circle and then chase him. There's going to be some laser hits raking across the ground behind you, right? Like that flying hunter killer still chasing you. T2 and John Connor get pinned in, uh, into a parking structure, and uh, the flying HK can't get to them, the big one. So it, it deploys four smaller guys, which are these, the flying hunter killers. And then the mini hunters are going to come around the column and shoot at you from, from out there, and that's when you get shot in the back. Arnold actually physically interacts with this one. And the thing's still trying to fly. It's still... So you have to do... You have to do... Quit your whining. Bam. 
but the actual flying ones that are in the scenes will be completely 100% computer generated. Yeah, and what we should do is time it so that it's chasing them. Boom, 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 boom. They pass this, boom, it's behind them. Oh, once you get right here, the top of that building's gonna go right here. 100 gallons of gas, okay? Top of the metal building. Boom, that goes, right? Yeah, we rehearsed it. 20 times. Oh, we're just, just going to push the bike slowly right now, and you can tell them what's happening. So we knew exactly how many seconds it took for them to get from their first position to their last position. This ain't going to take long to get through here. That's still going to be fire pluming up, even as you get right up in here, right? Uh, there were probably 20 different effects guys on different buttons setting all that pyro off. These are cork and spark hits. We're going to put these in the ground, shoot them, and it'll look like a striping run. This is where I'm triggering it. We call it a striker board. We'll connect it to that battery right before we get ready to shoot. And then I'll just take a screwdriver, and I'll just it'll fire boom, it off. Boom, boom, boom. OK, here we go. Stand by. Here we go. Roll cameras. We're rolling. And action. That was a nice explosion. This whole run is only 12 seconds. It's getting hectic. From this position, get down. Hasta la vista, baby. When we come back, we'll see how Universal Studios Hollywood faced the challenge of putting it all together for an experience that's breaking the screen barrier. And that's a wrap. Very good, guys. Thank you, one and all. I appreciate the scramble on that last take. I think we got it. It looked good. Once Terminator 2 3D had completed principal photography, the production moved Ready. to Santa Monica-based digital Ready. domain One. for the challenge of creating mind-boggling, never-before-seen visual effects and blending them seamlessly into Cameron's action-packed 3D film. Unfurling skies. Go, go! We're able to put Arnold and, and, uh, and Eddie Furlong on a motorcycle racing through the middle of a futuristic battlefield 100% realistically in 3D with the foreground in perfect stereo and the background in stereo, but the two weren't in the same place at the same time. Now, can we get a time code on this shot? One of the many things that's unique about this project is the way we're using the visual effects because previous large format, you know, 70 millimeter 3D projects, uh, have been limited to, to using optical and miniature effects, and we're able to use a 3D computer-generated animation, or CG animation, and um, spit that out at very, very high resolution. That's Skynet? Yep. Can I ask why we're heading toward it? You don't want to know. At the very end of the show, after this long chase sequence in Act 2, we end up inside Skynet completely computer-generated environment that had to hold up on three screens, not one, and in 3D, in stereo. And we essentially built all the objects as though they existed in the same scale as the theater. So our screens here, are, they're 50 feet wide. So these objects in our 3D space exist at that same kind of size. And that way, we could place cameras as though they actually were the eyes of somebody in the audience. Because the computer-generated animation of the 3D film would have to work in sync with the live action on stage, a series of tests were conducted to give the creative team an idea of how the two would work together. You know, we've been working on the stage for other timing purposes, but a week ago was one of our first real tests with the film. This is great. All three screens are opening up for the first time, and the audience is going to be looking at this in 3D. It's just blind choreography, just our best guess at what's going on. We have never seen it with film with until film. maybe tonight. And there were a lot of revelations that night and Jim was there and we spent three or four hours uh, really really going through the live stage and as it relates to the 3D. I'd really get marks down hit you know hit these marks it should look like a like a you know dance studio. You gotta come up and you well, gotta go like that and then okay if you want to stop that's easy. I don't Shut see up. how that's gonna be possible until all this stuff is is hard choreographed on the stage. Yes I agree. 
And I don't see how that's going to happen until we start getting some more animation up here on the TV. Right. And that information then requires either us in the live staging to make changes or requires the film people to make some changes, modifications. You go through an iteration of change, come back. OK, well, it actually takes no. this long no. for the live actor to run from this point on the stage to the other. So we now have to go back, change our animation in order to make all of these different things work. And we're kind of having to work together like this because there's no way to actually test it except to get in these mock-ups and do it with, a, with bodies on stage and film up there and, and put the glasses on and you begin to see how these things are going to relate. As final adjustments were made to the film and choreography, completion of the Cyberdyne Theater at Universal Studios Hollywood would include a wide array of pyrotechnics, physical effects, and specialized audio to create a completely unique sensory experience. Automatic targeting systems active. Fire. The sound design for T2 Battle Cross Time is unique because it's a 3D experience and we're trying to enhance the 3D picture with by creating an, an illusion of 3D audio in this venue. So they have to be able to see the sound and feel the sound coming to them. They also have to be able to feel and see the sound as it goes deep into the scene. With a custom-made system using 24 tracks of digital playback and 66 separate speaker locations, the sound designers were able to completely engulf the audience in the Terminator experience. There's no other theater like this in the world. This is a very unique experience, and I think that Universal seems to deliver on that. They're cutting new grounds every time, and, and this is definitely going to be something to try to beat. Let's bust the move. So the thing is really a kind of sensory assault at that level. Hit him up nuts! Hold on. You are completely enveloped in this 3D world. Break it! Break it! It's good! It just keeps coming at you. We use environmental effects, 3D effects, it's the whole kitchen sink. And that makes it huge and it makes it wonderful. That's the kind of experience I want them to have and that's what we will give them. They'll go in thinking it's just some gimmick and they'll see that it's actually a continuation of the storyline. It's almost like a third Terminator film. It's just that you can't go to see it in any theater in your, in your neighborhood. There's only one or hopefully two theaters in the world that you can go to see the next Terminator movie in. I don't think anybody's going to walk out of the theater disappointed, that's for sure. Many hunters keep moving. Get down! 